have a specific message. I just want to talk about fathers. And that's very strange for me because I'm, I'm not usually thematic. I'm not usually thematic, but there's something so divine about, about the creation that God made. It's something so divine about the physiology, this biological manifestation of God on the earth. This physical, biological manifestation of God on the earth. We are made in this image and likeness, but we have a biology to us. I don't hear anybody. God is spirit. We've been infused with spirit, but there's also a biology to us. There's a divine, peculiar biology. No amens. No amens. Uh, there, there is a uniqueness to the creation. There is an absolute uh, complexity that goes along with being human. For God has given us creatorial power only second to his. God is the only one that can create something out of nothing. We cannot create anything that is not already created. Only God can create that which is not created. Hallelujah. Using nothing but the word of his power. All God's got to do is open up his mouth and speak and it is so. God can reach down into the dirt. He can reach down into the created dirt that he's made. The created dirt and formulate a man. The complexity of humanity formulated just by reaching into the dirt and grabbing minerals and water, clay, and formulating, 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 formulating. And then hold a lifeless figurine in his hand, so wonderfully, beautifully made, so complex from the inside out, from the smallest of organ to the largest organ known as skin, bringing about so many different complexities in a figurine, and then take it, number every hair on the head, know how many hairs that are on the head, y'all don't hear what I'm saying, and put everything in its place, the bone st skeletal structure, put the skeletal structure together to make sure, put cartilage to hold the skeletal bones together, put all of this uniquely, peculiarly together. And hold the figurine in his hand with angels scratching their heads and not understanding what God is doing. And he takes it and brings it to his beautiful mouth and breathes himself into it. He didn't just breathe the breath of life. He breathed, he breathed himself for he is life. So if he breathed the breath of life, he breathed himself for he is the resurrection and the and the life, the life, the life, the L-I-F-E. And he breathed the breath of life. He breathed himself into man. And man became a living soul. So that when God looked at man, he wasn't looking at the color of his eyes or the complexion of his skin. For God is greater than skin color. God is not bound by cultural traits and biological, you know, idiosyncratic traits. God is not bound by that. When God made us in his image and likeness, it had nothing to do with the texture of our hair, or the contour of our bodies, it had nothing to do with our physiology. The physiology just proved his handiwork. But the true essence of God is spirit. I don't hear anybody. The, 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 the way he made man was his handiwork. But when he took man and breathed into that figurine, that lifeless figurine, and man became a living soul, as soon as the breath of God, the Ruach, went into man, he became animated. And the brain clicked. And the heart beat. And the lungs expanded, and the organs worked, and the muscles contracted, and mobility came. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. This is 
the work of a master. This is the creation of a God. Uh, not a God, of the God. This is something only the God could do. So great was the creation of man that angels stood back in a band saying, what is man? We've never even heard of man before because there's never been a man before. What is man that you are mindful of him? Why did you create him? Why did you crown him with glory and honor? <laughs> Why did you make him only second to yourself? What is man that you would make man greater than us, the angels? And give them preference and call them your sons and daughters. What is man that is so unique that it causes God to pay attention? I don't hear anybody. Causes God to pay attention. What is man that causes God to get up off of his throne and come down into a bedroom? What is it about man that causes God to visit them in hospitals and lay his hands on them and raise them up from sickness? What is it about man that causes God to cancel the plan of death? What is it about man that causes God to interrupt the cycles? to make sure that his will is accomplished. Y'all are not hearing me. I was driving home from church the other night and a reckless car came up right behind me and he almost bumped my bumper to my alarm start going up when you're too close. And he was weaving and then he rolled next to me and he was this close, I could have reached out and touched the car. Then he fell behind me again and then came so close to rear-ending me as he tried to get over to the other lane. And as I drove, it hit me. There are angels around here. And I got, y'all not hear me, I got overwhelmed in the car. There are angels around here that kept that car back. That car that was close enough to cause my demise. But the angels of the Lord are given a charge over the human being to keep us in all of our ways. And Marcia, just that quick, he made me aware that the angels have a charge. Your humanity is only second to divinity. And the angels must serve you. What is man that God gives us this grace. What is man that God gives us this privilege? What is man, even in a sinful state, that he has still given us the power to be creative? What? What is man? God created everything from nothing before there was a proton, a neutron, before there was an electron, before there was a molecule, before there was an atom in the state of antimatter, God spoke and everything came to be that is. What a mighty God. What a mighty, y'all are not hearing. What a mighty, mighty, mighty God. What a mighty God that spoke the worlds into existence. And they have not ceased their orbit and their gravitational pull from the time he said let there be to this very day everything he spoke is still in order what a mighty God what a mighty mighty God and then he looks at mankind says I make you in my image and likeness 
I make you my sons and my daughters. You are from me. You are many me. I create all things from nothing and you will create all things from what I created. I created all things from nothing and you in turn will create all things by what I, from what I created. You will pull from the substance around you and you will cause it to come into being. You will pull from its ingenious thought. You will pull from resources. You will pull from support. You will pull from everything that you see from land to sea to air. You will pull it together and you will make this thing happen. Just as I made it happen with let there be, you will make it happen with what I created. Are you hearing me? I give you the power of creation. I give man the authority. Man, the dominion. Man, the power of creation. I don't hear you. And then after he makes man in his own image and like this, puts them in a garden. This is not a fiction. This is not fictitious. It's not a fairy tale. Put us in a garden in the Mesopotamian area. Right on the cusp of African, Mesopotamian. <laughs> Put us there in a place that was called Eden and gave man the power to create. He named everything that was created and then God pulled a rib out of him and made a woman. For in order to create, you need a woman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in order to create you need my brother you need a woman yeah. hallelujah for a woman is going to make you a real man yeah. a woman is going to make you fulfilled yeah. a woman is going to complete your assignment or at least start your assignment so that you can complete it a woman is necessary in order to fully develop you my brother for the truth of the matter is, I called you, my brother, to be a life giver. And without a receiver, you cannot give life. So in order to make you into whom I've called you to be life giver, I must give you a woman. Oh, God. I know this is Father's Day. But you cannot become a father. It'll hit you in a second. You cannot become a father without a woman. If I could drop this mic without breaking it, I'd drop it. You can never be a father without a woman. Well, I'm adopting, but you had to adopt from a woman. Well, I'll have a surrogate, but you need a woman for a surrogate. Test two, baby. Well, you still need the egg of a woman. This, I know this isn't Mother's Day, but I'm just talking about fathers right now. You need the woman because that's why God pulled the woman out of man. To fulfill and complete the assignment that would make a house a home. That would make a male a man. And he put within us the ability of the dual sexes. He put in us the ability to create. He put in man the seed and he put in the woman the egg and he gave the uterus an assignment to incubate the child. In order to make the male a man, incubate the seed. In order to make the man the father incubate the seed. Hallelujah. I'm trying to get through to you. And God did something very unique and very mystical and very spiritual. Gave the man a protein sperm. 
one wiggly-tailed sperm out of ten, out of a hundred million sperm that contend for the egg, I'm teaching biology 101. Out of the 100 million sperm that contend for the egg, God has ordained for one, 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 one sperm to, to, to achieve the goal of making a man a father. And the one sperm goes into the egg and all of a sudden it emits a chemical that kills the rest of the sperm. Oh, help me somebody. Kills the rest of the sperm. And then that egg and sperm go through a dance. And the uterus go through a dance. Oh, ho, ho, gandala mashi. And then in trimesters. Am I saying the right word? And in trimesters go by. And this seed, this sperm, this protein glob begins to formulate and while it formulates on the inside it does something psychologically on the outside to the to the man he automatically if he's a good man if he's a good man he goes into another mode of living that deals with security that deals with provision that goes to another level of accountability and responsibility. There's an emotional shift that happens in the man while a, while, while, while a pregnancy happens in the woman. So that when the baby finally comes out of the matrix and the, and the man stands there, no longer just a man, but transformed at the entrance of that child into the world, immediately transformed into father. I don't hear nobody here. Immediately transformed into father. Why immediately? I thought he was a father from the time that the sperm hit the egg. No, because something could have happened to end that. But when that baby comes out and that first gasp of air is taken in and the first cry and wail takes place, it transforms two human beings from husband and wife to mother and father. I don't hear anybody. No, no, no. Now the reason why, and I'm going, to, I'm going to end this quickly. The reason why I'm not hearing a unanimous roar is because in this society, we don't know husband and wife. We know mother, and we know, we know daddy that, 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 that's not in the house. But in the scheme of God's wonderful plan, it was meant to be husband and wife before they become mother and father. I'm just setting things straight. I'm about to go into an area that's going to get much controversy, I'm sure. People are waiting with bated breath for me to say something controversial so that they can blog about it, blog about it, so that they can put it out on the internet, so they can talk about the intolerance of Donnie. Oh my God, he's still preaching hate. Oh no, I'm not preaching hate, I'm preaching truth. Preaching truth. That the true essence of fatherhood is being able to have a wife that is your wife only. Oh, this is not archaic. It's just forgotten in the society. It, to have a wife that is your responsibility that you prove to be accountable for, responsible for, and, and, and treat her well and treat her well. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives. Ah. This, this, this is talking to husbands so that you can become a good father. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself as a ransom for her. Uh, I'm, I'm try, I'm, 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 give me 15 more minutes and I promise you I'll be gone. I'm already over time. But give me 15 more minutes. Husbands, love your wives. Before you progenerate, before you go into, into having children, love your wives first. So this way you're not doing something just for the children. 
I'm only staying with you just because of the kids. I'm only keeping this marriage together just for the kids. No, no. If you love your wife first. Uh, I need to hear some brothers say amen. I need some brothers. I need some men to say amen. Uh, if you love your wives first, then you do things because of the matrimony. Not, the, not just for the patrimony. You're doing it for the matrimony. You're doing it for the sake of marriage. And, that, that, and that's the thing that changes the whole dynamics of the relationship from marriage to family. For you're not really a family until you bring forth a child. I didn't hear anybody. You're not really a family until you bring forth a child. And once, once that happens, then you, if you really pay attention, the transformation is mystical. Mystical. All of a sudden, the responsibilities kick in. And all of a sudden, you, you, you have a, a, a love that is greater than any love that you've ever known. You can look at your wife with a sense of appreciation for the life giver delivered the seed but then the real husband looks at the wife and sees her as the life bearer that has to hold this thing in incubation, just watch it grow inside of her for nine months and have the sensitivity to know that what's in her belly is a byproduct of me. A byproduct of me, my DNA, my, my substance. And so I must love her so that the baby can feel love in the stomach. The father has a great, awesome responsibility. Love her till the baby feels the love. Hallelujah. Treat her well so that the baby has no complications. Don't frustrate her so that the baby doesn't become nervous. To embrace her so that the baby can feel the love even though the baby is not cognizant of it. But subliminally, spiritually, emotionally, the baby feels the love of the mother and father. If there's hell and havoc, the baby comes out with nervous conditions. But the father secures. The father protects. The father provides. The father supplies. The father covers. The father gives. The father sacrifices. I don't hear anybody. And the father doesn't mind losing sleep. The father doesn't mind sweating. The father will go to the level of exhaustion to make sure that his children are cared for and that his wife is honored. This is a very low room today. I preach against this society. I preach against this society. Well, I'm a mother and father to my child. I'm, I'm the daddy to my child. Because I don't need no man. I'm, I'm mama and daddy. That's impossible. Your, 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 your biology refuses that. Your biology tells you that there's no way in the world that you can be a father to your child. For you don't have the testosterone to be so, nor do you have the genitalia that would make you so, nor do you have the fortitude or the mentality that would have you be so. You are a mother. You may be super mom, but that's it. Your mom, your mom. There can be no replacement of dad. I don't hear anybody. There can be no replacement for dad. That's the way that it works. Well, no, well, well, well I'm dead to my child, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm, there's two dads. The me and my husband were dads. No, and I don't say this to belittle or demean, but I just say this to correct. No, no, I, 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 my, this is my husband. This is Pride Month. I understand. This is my husband, and we're dads. Mm, well... A dad has got to be a life giver. 
There are adopted children. There are, and they're just as much your child. But you cannot use this as an alternative to the plan of God unless there is a, there's, there's, a, there's a heart situation that makes you want to adopt or there's a physical situation so that you can't have your own child, but not because there's a biological situation. Don't clap. There's a biological situation, meaning that there's two men and none of them have a uterus. The thing that makes same-sex relations not work is because it does not produce life. You all don't understand what I'm going in, what I'm getting into by telling this truth. You don't understand the level of backlash. But it's, it's a matter of the truth. Two men, two women together cannot bring forth life. You have to, homosexuality cannot bring forth life. Same sex does not bring forth life. You must go into heterosexual practices to bring a child into a homosexual relationship. I'll teach it by myself so this way you don't get in trouble. And that is the thing. If it doesn't bring forth life, then it cannot be really the, the, the intention of God. I'm not talking about that which is, that which is sickness or that which is, you know, that th there's a problem biologically. I'm talking about out of, the, out, out of creatorial mindset uh, and with a creatorial mindset. There's got to be an element of life giving. Uh, this is harder than I thought today because there's no ha <clears throat> today. This is just sobriety. There's got to be, uh, uh, there's got to be an interchange of opposite sex and their physiology in order for this to happen. Uh, am, I, am I making you nervous? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, some of you, some of you are nervous. There, there has to be. So if it doesn't bring forth life, in general, there will always be specific, you know, uh, specific, you know, uh, situations, you know. But in general, if it doesn't bring forth life, it's not God. Everything God made brings forth life. Everything that God made has a life-bearing seed in it. I don't hear anybody. From trees to plants to flowers to fruit, I don't hear anybody here. From animals to insects to birds to fish, everything that God has created in his, for his purpose has the life, pow, the power of life to regenerate. And if it does not have the possibility of regenerating life, then it is not really of God. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to be controversial. I'm just trying to be concise. And it, is, and it is the will of God that men and women are, 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 are in union together. Amen. I see some of y'all still stiff back there. It's okay. Cameras, I want y'all to make sure y'all get the people in the back because they, they're nervous. <laughs> it is the will of God for man and woman to be together because God has always intended for this to be the way of life. It's the circle of life. It is the way that life is supposed to continue on and be propagated and move forward. Now, people can love whoever they want to love. I'm not in, I, that's not my call. You can love a goat if you want to. That ain't my business. But I'm talking about the will of God. That's my business. And I do so without fear. I do so without reservation. I do so without, uh, without, without permission from man. I must declare what the truth is. And if you're going to be a father, you've got to do it God's way. You've got to do it the way that God intended. A father's got to be the source of instruction. A woman is the source of wisdom. The mother is the source of wisdom. If you read the book of Proverbs, it speaks of mothers and women with wisdom. It calls wisdom her. It uses the feminine pronouns her for wisdom. But then when it speaks about instruction, it speaks about your father. 
It said, hear the instructions of your father. For the father gives you a guideline on how life is supposed to go. And the woman gives you the wisdom on how to go about those guidelines. A real father takes his child under wing and begins to teach that child how to go through life. The real father shows the child what it takes in order to make it through life. Every young girl gets her first example of the man she's to marry by the father. If he's a good man. I say it again, if he's a good man, every little girl will have her first inclination of what, a, what her husband should be like if her father's a good man. And just like every young man will see what kind of woman he's supposed to marry if his mother is a good woman. It's only when you don't have that good father that the, the, the daughter goes into waywardness. It's only when you don't have that strong father of integrity that the son may veer into a lifetime of, 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 mis, of misfortune and dysfunction. Because a father is, uh, he's not only instructional, he's correctional. Am I taking too long with this? I know you're going to have to go eat. A father's not only instructional, he's correctional. Something about a father that brings, brings some kind of order. My father, we would be in a house full of children, carrying on, screaming, hollering, running around the house all day long. Got all these kids in the house, they had children every year. I'm not playing, they had children every year. Every year you was going to have a child. Kids, come here, I got something to tell you. Oh, not again! We're already sleeping far to a bed. I already got Sherry and Olivia's feet in my face. And we would carry on and we would jump on the bed and do everything we weren't supposed to do. And when that, about 5, 6 o'clock p.m., when that door opened up and you heard those boots walk through the house, you immediately came into order. Not one word spoken just simply came on the scene. That's what happens with a father. I'm, I'm trying to help you here. Father don't have to say too many words at all. Mother will talk till she turn blue in the face. Father comes to come in and say, hey, sit down. Because there's something about the masculinity. There's something about the power of that man that is unspoken because it is godly. Some of y'all sisters is having a hard time with this one. But the truth is, I'm telling you from my experience with my dad and my experience with my son. I was not the example of a good father. Allow me to end with this. I was not the example of, the good, of a good father. I did not marry the woman that I procreated with. I went outside of the confines of biblical order. I sinned. I did not obey the scriptures that I taught and preached. I sinned. I take off all the trappings I take off all the mitigating words. No, I sinned. And I brought a son into this world. And immediately my obligations had to shift. For I had to do more because I did it wrong. There was a lot suffered because I did it wrongly. How can you preach to me about doing it right when you did it wrong? I can preach to you because I did it wrong. And I can preach to you because I betrayed what my father showed me. For I never lived in a home that was without a father. 
I never lived in a home where the father wasn't present and providing. I never lived in a home where I had to ask who my daddy was. So I knew the right way, but I did the wrong thing. I knew how a father was supposed to act, but I became a father by a wrong action. And now I've got to work twice as hard to make sure I heal the wound as a father who did it wrongly. I've got to make sure that he knows that although it was done wrongly, he's not my mistake. I got, I got to let him know that he's the joy of my heart. He, no, no, I got to let him know that he's the reason why I pray at night. I got to let him know that I cry at the thought of him. I got to let him know that I'm overjoyed at every text and every call and got to let him know that he's always got my heart and whatever I have is his. Got to let him understand that he is inextricably linked to my life and that, and that there is no real life any longer without him. Since he came into this world, there is no life without him. I've got to let him know. I've got to let my son know that he has an inheritance. I gotta let my son know what a good father does even in a bad situation. I gotta let my son know that there is a responsibility that you cannot shirk. I gotta let my son know that I am on hand and I am hands on. I gotta let my son know that one day when he becomes a father, Franco, when he becomes a father, that he will remember the instructions of his father. How could, how could, how could, how could Bathsheba write to her son Lemuel? How could this fallen woman who, who let a king impregnate her in an adulterous situation write a, write a whole dissertation about a virtuous woman for she understood the virtuous woman by the lack of virtue she had in this situation. And she taught, who can find a virtuous woman? Her prices are above rubies. She takes care of her home. Why can she write this letter to her son? Because she's saying, that's not how I started, baby. But that's what I want from you. You can use your mess up as a message. I'll say that again. You can use your mess up as a message. And just as that woman wrote one of the most quoted verses concerning a mother and women from her failure, I stand today to tell you about the virtues of a good father from my failure, from my faults, from my flaw, from my fall. I stand to tell you what a good father should be based on the good one that I had. The mystery of fatherhood, the mystery of procreation, the mystery of being able to bring into this world life, the mystery of the true dynamics of security that would cause you to even sacrifice your own life for that which you brought into the world. The mystery of fatherhood comes from the very example of the king himself. For his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
the everlasting father because he's eternally creating and that which he creates he takes responsibility for he never shirks responsibility you're a good good father that's who you are that's who you are and I'm loved by you that's who Good, good father, who you are, that's who you are, that's who you are, and I'm loved by you, that's who I am, that's who I am, oh Lord, who I am. I've never danced, I've never danced with my father. This is the first time ever that I feel like that I feel like I'm dancing with my father. For God does dance with us if you don't mind. And and and, and literally you can stand in your room and just And you're not just dancing before him, you're dancing with him. For God does dance. God does that. And, and, and I'm going to do something very weird. For those of you that don't mind being a little weird, stand up and in front of your chair, just dance with your father. Just dance with your father. Just dance. Come on. You're a good, good father. That's who. That's who you are. I don't see you dancing. You're just swaying. And I Somebody just twirl and dance. You're a good father. That's who you are. That's who you are. I am the one that's loved by you. Who I am. Who I am. You're a real good father. Some of you wanted to dance, but you felt a little weird. But I don't mind. I don't mind. I see you embracing. You're not embracing yourself. You're embracing him. You're embracing God. These love displays are, are, are a part of the relationship. Sometimes I think about God and I cry. Not because of sorrow. Not because of sadness, not because of depression, but the very thought of him brings to tears because he's a good, good father. Oh, that's who you are. Oh, that's who you are. And I am loved by you, Lord. Oh, that's who I am. Oh, oh that's you are, you are a real good father. Yeah, oh, my. Yeah, oh, oh, oh. And I'm loved by you, Lord. That's who I am. Everyone standing, we're going to. I'm going to let you go home. I'm going to let you go home. Hallelujah. This has been a different service. But I want you to love God like your father. Not just like a deity, but like your father. And I want you that are men to become great fathers 
And even if you've fallen along the way from your responsibility, pick it back up again. Do you hear me? Pick it back up again. Even if you've messed up along the way, resume. Love on your child. Even go back and apologize to your child if you, if you slacked off on your responsibility. Let your child know the, the, the accountability that goes along with being a father. On this Father's Day, I've done my best to depict the spiritual aspect, the cultural aspect of being a father. But it's up to us to live it. To my son Matthew, I love you. To my boy, I love you. To my daughter Michelle and my two grands, Charlie and Elijah, daddy loves you. To every one of my spiritual sons and my spiritual daughters, I love you. I love you so very much. To the household of faith, as your spiritual father in the gospel, I love you. I love every one of you.